So I want to speak about our work on the um, mechanics of the actin cortex of cells, in particular about the measurement of the Poisson ratio of the actin cortex. But um, let me maybe start by motivating why we should actually care about cell mechanics. And um, the reason for this is that um, many biological processes require that cells are actually deforming. And um, here are a couple of examples. So one example is cell division and there um, cells need to deform away from an interface shape, which depends on the cell type and the situation of the shell, a cell. And then it rounds up um, to approach a spherical shape and make proper space for the mitotic spindle. And then it constricts in the middle to become two daughter cells. So a, quite a well orchestrated sequence of division uh, of uh, cell shape changes. And another example is cell migration. For instance, here, the migration of a white blood cell that squeezes through the wall of a blood vessel to enter surrounding inflamed tissue. So this is called extravasation, this process. And clearly also here, the cell needs to change shape and squeeze through this pore. And another example is morphogenesis. So the process of uh, the emergence of shape um, of an organism, for instance, um, during embryogenesis. And one particular example shown here is the process of ep epithelial folding. So in order to understand these biological processes that require um, cellular shape changes, it is necessary to understand the mechanical properties of the cells and of course also to understand how the forces are generated within the cells that drive this deformation. Okay, so one major determinant of cell mechanics is the actin cytoskeleton. And as the name suggests, um, this is something or has a similar task as our bone skeleton in the body. So this provides like a mechanical scaffold to the cell, giving mechanical integrity and giving a certain shape memory. And we look at a particular structure of the actin cytoskeleton, namely the actin cortex. And the actin cortex you can see here um, in green. So this is actually a mitotic cell. It looks similar in non-adherent interface cells. And um, there we have a polymeric layer um, made from actin polymers. So actin is a protein in the cell that polymerizes, forms these polymer strands that you can see here in the electron micrograph, and it, which is then tightly interwoven into uh, a network here at the periphery of the cell right underneath the plasma membrane. And there it provides a mechanical support to the plasma membrane. And um, we do not only have actin um, inside the actin cortex or, uh, or polymerized actin inside the actin cortex, we also have other associated proteins. And uh, one important one is uh, myosin or myosin motor proteins. Um, indicated here in red in the schematic. Um, and these are proteins that attach to the actin polymers um, and actually pull on them. So they essentially act as force dipoles. Um, and this is an active process. So it consumes the um, biological fuel ATP and thereby generates um, macroscopic uh, contractile pre-stress in this actin polymer shell. So this actin polymer shell, the cortex is under uh, mechanical tension, even in spite of the presence or in spite of no presence of actual mechanical deformation. So uh, to a certain extent, we have here an analogy to a water balloon situation. So in the water balloon, we have the rubber sheet uh, at the outside of the object being under me mechanical tension. In the case of the balloon, this is due to mechanical strain. In the case of the actin cortex of the cell, this is due to these active motor proteins being present. And inside we have a hydrostatic pressure excess, which is being balanced by this mechanical tension at the periphery. Okay, so this um, pre-stress in the actin cortex actually provides the cell with an effective surface tension. So the concept of surface tension we know from colloidal droplets or um, for instance, oil droplets in water as shown here. And there the surface tension actually uh, emerges from uh, an interfacial energy um, 
that is associated to the water oil interface. Uh, on the other hand, in the cell, as I said, it's due to the um, active contractile pre-stress, uh, which is there due to these active motor proteins. And the force balance at the periphery is captured by Laplace's law, which looks like that for the case of a spherical object. So the pressure axis inside is balanced by two times the surface tension divided by the radius of the sphere. Okay, so we use a particular setup to probe the mechanical properties of the actin cortex, and this is based on atomic force microscopy. Here you can see a co conventional setup um, of an atomic force mic microscope with a force probe, a so-called cantilever, which can be deflected by mechanical interaction with a surface underneath. Um, so you can press it against the surface, the cantilever is deflected and responds to the laser light which is being reflected on the tip um, is being reflected in a different way. And we use um, non-conventional AFM cantilevers, so without such a spike here in the, uh, in the end, but with a wedge um, at the tip, which we um, custom make. And uh, this now allows to um, squish the cell with this wedge of the cantilever and to have a parallel plate confinement assay with a very precise force readout from the AFM and also a very precise readout of cell height during the measurement. And um, we image the cell from underneath, so we also see the cross-sectional area um, of the cell. So, and uh, Laplace's law, as already mentioned before, can um, again now be applied to read out cortical tension in this essay. Um, it looks a little bit more different now because we do not have a spherical shape, but um, uh, a shape with two different kinds of um, principal curvatures. So overall, cortical tension is given as the force, force read out by the AFM divided by the contact area. So this is the contact area between wedge and cell and times this geometrical factor here, which is just um, the sum of the two principal curvatures. So um, we can measure the material stiffness of the actin cortex um, with the setup. And um, the way we do is, uh, the, way we, the way we do that is we um, perform oscillatory squishing of the cell. And this allows us to actually probe actin cortex, cortex mechanics at a distinct time scale. Because as you will see, the uh, mechanics of the cortex actually is time scale dependent um, and therefore uh, gives different values at different time scales, and, and therefore we probe it at, at, a, at a specific frequency that means inverse um, of a particular time scale. So what happens when we perform this cell compression is we actually um, increase the surface area of the cell. So um, we see in the measurement that the cell volume stays roughly constant. That means if we deform the cell away from the spherical shape, the overall cell surface area and the cortical area is being stretched up. And as you could see in the simulation here, if we squish it from the spherical shape down to 50% of the cell height, we have um, roughly a 15% area increase. And um, as you could see in the experiment, we had very shallow height oscillations. So there we have only area strains of roughly 1% and we have um, oscillatory dilation on co and compression of the cortical area. So this is our uh, readout from the experiment. We uh, impose cantilever height oscillations at a specific frequency and we see in response uh, force oscillations uh, recorded by the atomic force microscope. And then we apply our data analysis scheme to extract cortical tension over time, essentially using Laplace's law as I was showing you before, and uh, we compute cell surface area over time um, using the cantilever height and anticipating that the cellular volume stays constant. So, and um, the time average of this cortical tension we actually associate um, to the active cortical tension generated by the motor proteins. So even in the absence of deformation, there is tension, of course, but the oscillations which are superimposed are deformation induced 
and thereby can tell us about the mechanical stiffness of the cortex. And um, essentially we have here something like a stress signal and a deformation signal and pink the cell surface area. Um, and this is used for a rheological analysis. So we determine the amplitudes uh, by sinusoidal fit for the stress and the deformation signal. And uh, the ratio of the two gives us an elastic modulus and the phase shift between the two tells us about the uh, viscoelastic nature of the material. So in particular for a solid like material, we would have a zero degree phase shift. So there stress and strain would be in phase. And for the limit case of a 90 degree phase shift, uh, we would have a completely liquid like material. And for a viscoelastic material in general, we will have something in between zero and 90 degree. So we measured um, the viscoelastic stiffness of the cortex at different frequencies. And this is the result here. You see in uh, red, the so-called storage modulus, the real part um, of our elastic modulus. Um, and this describes the solid-like response of the material and the imaginary part of the elastic modulus, the so-called loss modulus describes the liquid-like response. And um, as you can see, we have a high frequency regime for our uh, measurements here where the solid-like response dominates. So the storage modulus is significantly higher than the loss modulus, um, but we then have also a characteristic transition time scale tau um, where the two curves are crossing over and um, a lower frequency regime where the loss modulus starts to dominate. That means the cortex starts to behave more and more liquid-like. This is actually also what is kind of expected because we know that the cortex undergoes turnover. So it depolymerizes and repolymerizes uh, all the time. And that means uh, over time, the cortex will forget about a certain reference shape that it had in the past um, because it repolymerizes then in, the new in a new shape over time, like after a deformation. Okay, um, so, so far I have br brushed a little bit under the rug um, that every material needs at least um, two mechanical parameters to describe its mechanics. So here we had an effective elastic modulus that describes the resistance towards this um, uh, cortical dilation at a specific confinement height of the cell. Um, but in principle, um, we need at least two elastic parameters. So for instance, the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio of the material. And if the material is not isotropic, um, one needs even more parameters than that. And um, let's consider the simple textbook example of a homogeneous deformation of the cylinder by applying forces to the top and bottom plate as indicated here in the sketch. Um, and then just as a reminder, the Young's modulus was defined as the force density P divided by the relative elongation of the cylinder and vice versa, the Poisson ratio tells us about the magnitude of the Poisson effect. That means um, how much the cylinder changes its radius in response. So new the Poisson ratio is the relative radius change divided by the relative length change and then with a minus sign in the front. And in particular for an incompressible material, we have that new equals 0.5, that means the volume of the cylinder or of any other workpiece would not be changed at all by deformation. So it deforms always in a way that the volume also locally is preserved. So in the biophysics literature, a lot of people always assume that um, the cytoskeleton is incompressible. And um, one reason for this choice is um, that one says that the cortex is essentially a porous material filled with liquid. And since liquid is incompressible, um, also the entire material has to be incompressible. However, um, as you can see here with this analogy of the sponge, of course, if you compress it slowly, you can squish out the water out of the pores. And in this way, 
um, it would clearly be compressible. So we challenged um, this assumption of incompressibility, which was prevalent in the field and set out to measure the Poisson ratio of the cortex and also uh, independence of the time scale. So in fact, this is one of the very few measurements of the Poisson ratio of the cytoskeleton because it's a very difficult uh, to access parameter of cell mechanics. Okay, and we, for this, also used this um, AFM cell confinement uh, setup. So we confined cells between the two plates, waited until the new shape becomes the reference shape of the material, and then we perform a small step of uniaxial compression and thereby deform a cortical area element. Um, and we have a certain amount of shear in response and a certain amount of dilation in response. And both area shear and area dilation are described by separate elastic parameters, the so-called area shear modulus and the so-called area bulk modulus. And both are, or can be written as functions of the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio if we have an underlying isotropic um, shell material. Okay, and we teamed up um, with collaborators from the group of Professor Sebastian Aland um, and um, yeah, his student, Marcel Mockbell, sorry, actually performed um, simulations of this um, compression, uniaxial compression of a shell that we apply to our cells. What they found is that uh, if we start from a relatively high um, reference height, then the contribution of area shear um, through the deformation is relatively large. It's shown here by the red color in the shell. But if we go to more and more confined cell shapes uh, as here, um, then the contribution of area shear goes down and we almost have only area dilation left. And this is of course a way to access um, these two different kinds of elastic parameters, the area shear modulus and the area bulk modulus. And what you see here is the effective elastic modulus that we determine in our experiments independence of normalized height of the cell. And uh, as you can see, this modulus increases with the normalized height. Uh, and this is because of an increasing contribution of uh, area shear. And therefore this increase also depends on the value of the shear modulus as shown here. And uh, phenomenologically, or, sorry, this curve converges to the area bulk modulus uh, for very low heights, um, as you would expect. And phenomenologically, we can capture this rise um, by an exponential increase um, of this functional shape with a amplitude alpha, which actually depends on the ratio between the area shear and the area bulk. And knowing this function, we can extract the ratio between the two parameters and thereby determine the Poisson ratio of the cortical shell. Okay, so we did corresponding experiments. So experiments corresponding to the simulations. That, mean we, that means we um, disturb the cell at large reference heights and also at low reference heights and then uh, also at a spectrum in between. And we determined this effective cortical shell modulus independence of cell height. And uh, we fitted the respective curves with the exponential function that I just showed you. And um, in this way, we could obtain uh, the amplitude alpha for each cell measured. And this uh, alpha then allowed us to obtain this ratio Ks over Kb for a particular cell and um, in correspondence, the Poisson ratio of the cell. And um, to summarize, um, we could measure the Poisson ratio um, independence of frequency for the cortical shell of, uh, I didn't mention that, of mitotic cells actually. And we see that the Poisson ratio seems to depend on frequency with a rise um, towards lower frequencies. And uh, for lower frequencies, the value suggests that it's more or less 
incompressible indeed. However, for faster frequencies or faster uh, deformations, we see a clear deviation, the value of around 0.2, which fits also very well with typical Poisson ratios um, of polymeric materials. So can we understand this uh, trend? Well, uh, in order to rationalize this, um, it's insightful to look at this formula here. So the Poisson ratio now as a function of the three-dimensional bulk elastic modulus here, curly K, and the three-dimensional shear elastic modulus. And in particular, you can appreciate if uh, curly K is much larger than G, then we approach 0.5. If this ratio drops, then mu goes further down and eventually would increase minus, uh, would, would approach minus one. And um, now we know that um, on larger timescales, our cortex, cortex material undergoes turnover. And um, it is a good guess to assume that this turnover hardly changes the uh, bulk elastic modulus, so the resistance towards compression, while the shear modulus would probably strongly decrease through this cortical turnover. And this can actually explain that the Poisson ratio then rises for larger timescales. And um, the only other material where I found a similar trend for the Poisson ratio independence of timescale um, are actually glassy materials. And uh, there, basically, people have reported the exact same trend. So this curve here shows Poisson ratio independence of relaxation timescale. Um, and again, we see Poisson ratio rises to a value close to 0.5. How can one understand this? Well, here um, it is um, the changes of the bulk modulus and the shear modulus independence of unjamming. Uh, unjamming hardly changes the bulk modulus, but strongly diminishes the shear modulus, um, giving rise um, to an increase of the Poisson ratio. And with this, I'm at the end. Let me quickly summarize. So the actin cortex is a thin polymer shell at the periphery of the cell, uh, important for cell shape regulation and cell mechanical integrity. And we can measure actin cortex mechanics and also its pre-stress um, with our atomic force microscopy setup. And um, in particular, we could also extract the frequency dependent Poisson ratio of the actin cortex and see that it's indeed uh, changing with time scale. And with this, let me quickly acknowledge my collaborators. So the uh, establishment of the AFM set up uh, cell confinement assay was in collaboration with Jonna Hellenius and Daniel Müller from Basel and also with Frank Willicher and Tony Hyman, who I did my postdoc with. Um, the simulations for the Poisson ratio um, extraction were from the group of Sebastian Alland uh, and the student uh, Marcel Mockbell um, did them. And um, for uh, another project where we determine cell mechanics independence or cortical mechanics independence of epithelial mesenchymal transition, we worked together with Anna Taubenberger and Karsten Werner. And with this, um, I'm at the end and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, are there any questions? I have a question. Oh, please. I can see around all the icons on my face. Um, that's a lovely talk. Um, I'm just curious, because I know when we look at use AFM techniques for looking at things like adhesion or friction and wear and adhesion, oftentimes there's a, a big dependence on the roughness of our tips and the roughness of our surfaces. So I'm just curious how when you add cells into the mix, are there do you run into issues of, of, of adhesion at the scale of the cells or do you have to be careful in how you pick your tip, your, how, your AFM set up? Do the cells like to stick to it? And how do you, what, what sort of factors come into play when you're setting up this experiment? Yeah, so we make those wedges uh, from um, UV uh, curing glue. So, and they are relatively smooth, but it's not, it's not a typical pyramidal indenter or also not a spherical indenter as you usually have. And the lower surface is a glass bottom of a glass bottom dish. 
And um, for the mitotic cells, um, adhesion plays very little role simply because um, they are naturally de-adhering to become round and um, also have a very high cortical contractility, which, which drives them into this round shape. Uh, for interface cells, we are actually coating the dish bottom. So we, we measure them in suspension to have them round um, and then to keep them from adhering, we coat the dishes. Uh, otherwise they would indeed uh, adhere too fast and that is not what we want. So we try to avoid adhesion as much as possible. And um, yeah, for particularly fast adhering cells, it might not even work, but uh, we did it for HeLa cells, we did it for a um, couple of breast epithelial cell lines, um, and there we could um, do the job with a coating with PLL pack of the dishes. Thank you. Maybe um, one last question from Francesco. I think the other questions maybe we, we can uh, handle. Well, I, I go very quickly. It's actually a very nice question. So uh, for the surface tension, uh, is there any contribution from the membrane itself or not? Yeah, this uh, question come, comes very often. So um, indeed, it's a bit hard to, to answer. If you look at values of uh, membrane surface tension that people have measured in cells, they are supposedly very small. So in the micronewton mm -hmm. per meter range. So this is for instance okay. work or, or like one to 10 micronewton per meter, something like that. This is work from, from the Sheets lab, for instance. Um, so supposedly, this is rather small. It's a small correction to, to, to whatever you measure. Yeah, so this is what we measure is on the millinewton per meter yeah. or, or an 0.1 to 1 millinewton per meter scale. Mm. And uh, as I said, the membrane tension is between 1 to 10 or so micronewton per meter. So mm. significantly smaller still, of course, you need the plasma membrane for the cortex to maintain the, the surface tension because the, the membrane blocks um, or allows to have a certain pressure access inside the cell. Uh, without the membrane, this wouldn't work. So in the way mm, the mm, cortex mm, and the membrane are inseparable from each other and you need both together in order to have this. Um, so you're saying you're maybe measuring actually the, the collective effect uh, of, of a cortex plus membrane in a way. Yes, but still, I mean, if you kill the actin polymers by depolymerizing drugs and drugs that um, block the activity of myosin, it drops by about an order ah, of magnitude ah, okay, the, okay. the surface tension values. Okay. 